I apologize, I have no slides, just got the demo hopefully working, so let's just go straight to that. If you have Docker installed on your computer, please go to the URL ilp.rs or interledger.rs, and it will take you here, and you should follow the two instructions to run a interledger Rust node, and then try sending a test payment to me. And then once someone has done that, I'll start explaining what is going on. ILP.RS. Yeah or interledger.rs, whichever one. So these are the... Which country is that? Serbia. Serbian domain registrars love Rust projects. <laughs> and Rust projects love Serbian domain registrars because you get that perfect, <laughs> perfect short domain. Interledger RS is a uh, full, uh, fully, re fully rewritten implement implementation of the whole Interledger protocol stack in Rust. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why Rust is awesome and why you should switch to using it for everything. If you haven't already interacted with any people that are really into Rust, then let me be the first to try to indoctrinate you. Um, also, I'll give a little bit on why Rust is really great. Uh, and then talk a little bit about the design of this implementation and what kind of dark magic is going on behind the scenes to make this node, like interledger node thing work that some of you may be trying to run right now. Hopefully not trying, hopefully running. Okay, so how many people have heard of Rust? Cool. How many people have tried using it? All right. So Rust is a systems programming language developed by Mozilla. And the, the sort of genesis of it was that Mozilla was really tired of the fact that high level, like basically big vulnerabilities in the browser were coming from really low level memory management issues. And so these are just kind of fundamentally hard to solve issues when you're writing in C and C++. And to date, there's not been any language that is comparable as on performance, but also safe. So they were trying to figure out how do we make a language that's that fast, but doesn't give you the ways to shoot yourself in the foot. And they've been working on it for six plus years, uh, longer than we've been working on Interledger. And it's super methodically implemented. They made a lot of really awesome design choices. And so it works. Like it, it's a great language to use. It definitely has a, a bit of a learning curve, which is one of the main things that the community is trying to work on. But it has a bunch of really awesome things about it. And the community is super, super welcoming. Uh, when we've been discussing governance and stuff, I keep bringing up like, well, we should just copy how Rust does things. Because they, they have a really good structure for the project. And so one of the things I love about it is that it's this very low level, intense kind of language, but with a community that emphasizes being really welcoming. And so unlike the reputation of the C++ community is a bit like if you ask a question, the, the response you'll get on Stack Overflow is like, did you even read the manual? You get pushed away. With Rust, the, the community tries to be super, super welcoming. And one of my favorite examples of the extent they go to this is whenever you propose a change to the language, uh, one, of the, one of the main sections in the RFCs is often um, like ergonom code ergonomics with the idea of when a new developer approaches this feature, how natural will it feel to them without being super familiar with it already? And so like that's sort of baked into the, the thinking, which is just really, really awesome. So they're, they're working very hard on smoothing out all the kinks for, for learning it, but it's a really great language and I think it's going to take over a lot of stuff. So that's on Rust. Happy to chat more about that and sort of specifics of why it's great. Um, Interledger RS. So the, the idea behind this implementation was twofold. One, to try to make a really, really high performance and scalable implementation of Interledger. We've had a lot of conversations in the community about scaling Interledger stuff. So this is a kind of a different 
different take on some of the key design decisions, and then also written in a language that is designed to be really, really fast. So side note, um, I haven't done performance testing on this, but I very much look forward to somebody trying out performance testing on the different implementations, and I'm willing to bet money on Rust, Rust winning out, but let's see. Um, so I'll take you through a little bit. By the way, is anybody running those instructions? Did it work? Nice. Well, that's great. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll switch over to explain what happened with this Interledger node thing. So when you run this bundle, what, what it's actually running is there's a single Docker image that contains the Rust, all of the Rust components bundled up, as well as an XRP-based settlement engine, and I'll go into exactly what it, what's, that's doing, um, and an instance of Redis. And so that's all bundled up, and you run that really easily. That is connecting automatically to a bootstrap node that's running on my laptop, janky demo thing, but th theoretically that would be just, there would be bootstrap nodes just running properly. I just didn't have time to set that up. So you automatically connect, you peer, it peers automatically with that node, they broadcast routing information to one another, and then you're on the network. Um, how it works with the settlement, so this is using on Ledger XRP settlement for the moment. Um, I am planning on, on adding more, and um, yeah, we can talk about how that works. Uh, but basically, every time it needs to settle, it just sends a simple on Ledger XRP transfer. In this case, it's, it's all testnet money, so you've generated a, a new account, peered with my node connector, um, and then, yeah, you've sent it. So what this node contains is this is, every, this is all of the interledger components. This is a connector, sender, and receiver, and also has an API to access it. So I'll actually go through, um, so over here in this like scrolling text thing, uh, on the left is the, the main node that everybody's connected to, and then on the right I have, have my node. So if I, I'm gonna just show you some of the API endpoints that the nodes ex expose. Um, I promise better API docs shortly. This is a local endpoint on my node, uh, just the slash pay endpoint, and I can send the SPSP receiver and the source amount so for the people that, um, that got it working, this was the, the API call that they were doing. It's a little slow because it's running over local time. Okay, so that worked. Yeah. So what that did is that sent an HTTP API call to my node to initiate an SPSP transfer. That went and queried the, the bootstrap node because that's what it's sending to for now. Um, got the SPSP details, sent off an ILP payment under the hood. Um, the, another API endpoint is for querying accounts. So a key feature of this implementation is that the idea of an account is a first class citizen. And I will give credit to Adrian for that idea who, pump, who pushed that idea a lot. And I'm a really, really big fan of it now. So kind of the whole package understands this idea of an account which makes a lot of things a lot easier to deal with than when it's sort of, that idea is sort of buried in plugins, which was the previous way of doing it. So just to give you a sense of what the accounts, the, they have a bunch of static configuration. Um, so there's the ILP address, there's authentication details, um, the minimum balance they can have, so th thing, things of that nature. And you can update accounts just by posting or putting, doing an HTTP post or put, to that API endpoint and update the configuration. Um, when you're doing the, um, when your node is connecting to mine, it, there's a like prepaid accounts. So what, what my node is enforcing is that you have to actually send me some money before I let you sign up for an account. But once you have sent, sent me some money, I kind of put that in a little bucket that's like, oh, I've gotten money from this address. I don't know who, which account that was for yet. Then when you come to create an account, I say, oh, that was, that was for you, great. Here's, now your account has balance and you've, you've created an account with me. I also have an admin API endpoint to just create accounts. So this is what like peering would look like for, in a more manual way is just I send an API, admin API call to my node to add you as a peer. Um, and then I can look at all the accounts on the node. Um, 
if I, I can check the routing table. So that's another kind of nice thing. So you can just check what is the node's view of its routing table right now. Um, those are the account IDs. So it says the prefix that it's going to and then which account that gets forwarded to. This is the SPSP endpoint. So if you, when you want to send money to any one of the accounts, there's kind of a default account that if you just put in the payment pointer version of this, it'll send to one account, but you can also send to specific accounts. Yeah, so if you want to send to account one, you can do slash SPSP slash one. That, so you can send to any, any one of the accounts on there. So this is the bootstrap node. So this one has quite a few more accounts. I, there are probably even more now that other people have signed up. Um, yeah, so there's a bunch of nodes. Uh, and so these are the, these are the details for, for each of the nodes that have connected. Um, and yeah, if I want to update one of the routes, I can just post or put to route slash static and then the prefix that I want to set and then that will be, be set and that will both be set locally and then also propagated to the peers. That's all for the, the API right now. I'm going to show a little bit of, dive a little bit into how this implementation works and how it's different. Um, certain API endpoints are admin only and other ones are not. So like the SPSP endpoint can be queried by anybody uh, because they want to be able to get the details. Um, they also, that's the, there's a slash ILP endpoint that's used to send ILP packets using the ILP over HTTP protocol that your peers can send to. So it will check the auth for which peer you got it from and sort of uh, account for that accordingly. Um, and then there's the admin endpoint. So the, the question is both Rafiki and Interledger RS are talking about this idea of a settlement engine. Is it the same one and is there a plan to settle or to standardize that? I think we're working off of similar ideas but not exactly the same. Um, and yes, I think we'll, we'll, we'll talk about whether there's way, ways to standardize that because it would be great to not, not duplicate that effort. Um, I'll, for reasons I'll explain in a second, the way that Interledger RS does settlement is, are, is fairly tightly coupled to some other things um, within, within the implementation that I think are quite good pieces of the design. Um, but let me explain how it works. So again, apologies for no slides. Don't try to read this. I, um, I don't even know if it's helpful to put that up there. Um, you can read, read this afterwards. Yeah, maybe it's, it's less, less helpful. Um, <laughs> never mind. So uh, <laughs> just look at me. Don't look at the text. Um, so the Interledger RS is designed around this concept of services. This is a co an idea that I copied directly from another project in the Rust ecosystem, um, which is built around these modular services. So what a service is, is it's just it's a thing that you make a request to, and it asynchronously, asynchronously gives you a response. Now, the framework that I was copying from is doing that in a very, very generic way. So it's just like, it's meant for modeling any type of request response based protocol. Interledger is a more particular kind of request response based protocol. And so the Interledger RS implementation uses specific types of services. There's two types of Interledger RS services. There's an incoming service and an outgoing service. And there's a very, very small difference between those two. So each of the components acts as this service thing, and it either handles a request or sends a request. Um, so it returns a future, which is the Rust like async thing. Um, the incoming request looks like this. It has a from account and the Interledger prepare packet, and the outgoing request has a from account, a to account, and a prepare packet. And that's kind of the core abstraction that this whole implementation uses. Uh, what's what I really like about this is that every single one of the components in this implementation implements this pattern. What that allows me to do is chain them together um, in two ways. So what is an account in this, in this framing? Um, a, an account is a relationship with one other party. Um, and that has some different parameters like how you talk to them, the, the credit limit that you have on, with them, 
maybe some settlement details. The, so the sender would have in their node an account that represents the connector, and the connector has an account that represents the sender, and the connector has another account that represents the next connector. Okay, good. Yeah. So this is like this is sort of the, the core thing for describing who we're interacting okay. with. One thing I really, really like about the way this is set up, are the, the services chained in one process, or are they doing RPC or sending messages between one another as different processes? So there's a section in the architecture description called monolith or microservices. And the thing that's really cool about this, this setup is that you can have it either way. So if you want to run it as one big monolith, I'll sh that's actually, so if you want to run it as a monolith, so that's like one process, nice to manage, that's what that interledger node bundle is. Um, and so I'll, I'll show you how that is set up. Um, that's in the interledger package. There's a method called run node Redis, which uses Redis as a, as a backend. Um, and what you can hopefully see here is the way these services are chained together. So at the very top, we create a BTP server. So this implementation speaks both BTP and ILP over HTTP. Um, so we create a, a BTP service. Then we wrap that in a validator service. And so what the validator is doing is checking things like, does the does the pre-image that you get match the condition? Is the packet expired? Things like that. Um, then you wrap that in an expiry shortener service. So each of these components exposes the exact same API, and so you can bundle them up in this way, where you just wrap one in the other. Um, so we wrap that in an expiry shortener service. So when we pass on a packet, we're going to reduce the amount of the expiry for that, for that packet. Um, then we have a stream receiver service. So this is another kind of neat part. This is both a connector and a stream receiver. And so what this stream receiver service does is check if an, a given packet that's coming through is meant was a stream packet that we can process. If so, it will just f fulfill it right away rather than passing it on. Then we have an exchange rate and balance service. So this checks the exchange, applies the exchange rates updates the balances, et cetera, obviously rejects it if the balance is, would exceed the limit. Um, we then have a, a router. So I mentioned that there's these incoming services which have the from and the prepare packet, and the outgoing service which has from, to, and prepare. And so the router is the thing that looks at the routing table and figures out which account are we sending to next and then adds, transforms it from an incoming request to a so-called outgoing request. Then once we've passed the router, we go to the CCP route manager, uh, which is Im an implementation of the connector to connector protocol that I think works all right, uh, which is surprising given, given that I, it was implemented in one weekend with a lot of help from Taiga's write up of the connector to connector protocol. If you try to implement the connector to connector protocol, uh, it is very difficult to figure it out from the code. And it was, uh, <laughs> it's one of those things where it just, you have to bounce around a bunch to figure out where, where things are going. And it was unbelievably helpful to have that, that write up, which Taiga put together based on reading the code, which is amazing. Um, so really big, really big shout out for that. And thank you for that. Um, so really helpful. So this implements the, the CCP route protocol. So this is a, a routing protocol manager. Notice that um, just like in, in Rafiki, that's separate from the, the router itself. So the router just looks at, I have this routing table and I'm very quickly just applying like which is the next, next hop for this packet. And the route manager is the actual, the thing that can populate the underlying routing table based on getting broadcasts from peers. And that could be much more complex, like have much more complex logic. Um, we can work on more secure routing protocols, et cetera, that this type of component could speak. The next thing um, is an ILDCP service. So um, that handles incoming, so ILDCP is the dynamic configuration protocol, which clients can use to query information about their account with a connector. Um, max packet amount, validator, you get the idea. 
Okay, so you, these are all chained services together. Now, these services can also be run as d separate microservices. And I'll just give a small example of that with the run SPSP server HTTP. Um, so this one is quite a bit simpler. Um, so this only has the um, this only has the HTTP server service, which pro which takes incoming HTTP or ILP over HTTP requests, turns them into this internal abstraction of the the request, and then passes it through the router, ILDCP service validator, um, and then the SPSP. Um, the SPSP and stream bits. So you can basically take all of these components and run them separately. So one of the things that I'm planning on doing is both having one package where you can just run all of these in one process and it's, it's very, very easy to use as you've hopefully now experienced. Um, and then a separate way of running it where you'd split out every single one of the services and then use Kubernetes or something like that to manage them as microservices and then have them scale nicely with one another. Big, big thank you to DJ for implementing another really cool feature, which is zero copy ILP packet forwarding. Um, so when you take in an interledger packet, um, we specifically made it so that the connector has to change exactly two fields before they forward a prepare packet, which are the amount and expiry. And we specifically made both of those fixed length so that they could be updated in place without copying the whole thing over. So this implementation actually implements that. And so when you take in a packet, there's no copying of the data in it and you just pass it on through, um, which is pretty neat. And so the amount of like serialization, deserialization is much, much less. Um, Rust also makes it really nice to work with just looking at a view, an immutable view of some bytes and then passing that around. The, the question was like, what, what's the protocol used between the different, different components? Right now I would just say HTTP because it's there and we have it, whatever. Um, we could obviously switch to something lower level. I'm just sort of anxious to spend less time implementing and re-implementing bilateral protocols. One kind of specific idea that I approached this with um, was that there should not be anything that's instantiated per account or per request. Um, so this is something we've seen as a, as a big memory hog for the JavaScript implementation, is that we've, we're instantiating things like plugins or um, kind of chain, these pipelines per account or per request. So this doesn't have any of that. There's a single pipeline of stuff and then it loads up this account object, which has all the static parameters, and basically passes that through. And each of the components that would act differently, depending on some account-specific configuration, um, what they do is um, there's this nice way of abstracting the accounts. So there isn't one type of account exactly. Each service that wants to operate on some specific parameters in the account gets to define their own abstraction that says, I only can operate on accounts that have this method. And so that method might be like the maximum packet amount that that account can use. And so then if it's the maximum packet amount checker, it just checks, okay, what's the maximum packet amount for this account, and then apply my logic. So there's no instantiation of a maximum packet amount checker for a specific amount. You're just applying it to some, some value. Um, and then what's great about Rust is that it actually makes sure that it is impossible to chain together services that don't have the right properties on them. So it checks at compile time if you try to pass a chain of services together that where one of the where the account doesn't have the max packet amount and you're trying to put the max packet amount checker in that chain, the Rust compiler won't let you do that. And so you know at, at compile time, does this have everything it needs in order to operate? Um, two more things to mention. The way that settlement happens. Um, a lot of the way I was thinking about this was designing this around a database because um, we've We've used databases in different ways under, underpinning our interledger implementations, and there's a key kind of way that this abstracts things differently. So 
um, when we were designing the Interledger plugins, uh, we were trying to think of, okay, we, might, we might, might want to have different databases underpinning this, so what kind of API should we give that plugin? Um, and I'm looking specifically at Ben because we spend a lot of time are, like, debating this and trying to figure it out. And so this goes a different way and tries to make it so that just the same way that each service can define its own, this is what I need from an account, there is also these store, uh, what I call a store um, trait. That is the abstraction over, this is what I need from the database. And you actually define, the service gets to define very specific methods that it needs from the database abstraction. And so instead of the data, trying to come up with a way of simplifying the database to present it, to, to be all things to all types of services, we go the other way and say, the services get to define very specifically what functionality they need, and then it's up to the store implementation. So a store implementation might be a store for Redis. Um, so I'll show you what, what that looks like. So it could be for Redis, or it could be for MySQL, or something like that. Um, so this will go and implement a bunch of, like, basically all of the store traits. Um, so I'll show you what that looks like. Scrolling down. Um, so here's an example. So the account store has a method that's called get accounts, and you get it by the account ID. It'll pass in a bunch of account IDs, and then it is expected to load those up asynchronously. Similarly, the balance store has a get balance as well as an update balances. And so the expectation is that the store implementation could be quite complicated in how it actually implements that underlying logic. But what's nice about this is that because it's very close to and tied to the database, you can leverage all kinds of really specific database features. So for example, the Redis one is using a bunch of, so I don't know if people have used Redis much before, but you can write Lua scripts that are executed in Redis. And so for updating the balances, there is a, yeah, here. So there is this update balances script, and that all happens atomically in Redis. Um, so that's the, the way that this kind of store lets you get, be really, really specific about how you're using the database and use very specific features. So one of the main issues we had when we were thinking of, all right, let's abstract away all the database features to be just a key value store. But then we realize uh, for certain things you want atomic transactions. When you're updating the balance, you need atomic transactions. So this kind of gets much more, more hands-on with the database. The other thing that I'll um, mention, about, or the, the other thing about this is a lot of the account configuration is actually stored in the database. So we've had a lot of complaints about the fact that a lot of the JavaScript configuration is defined in the config file. So if you want to update it, you need to reload the connector. This has much simpler configuration where you just point it at the database and most of the, most of the relevant account specific configuration is just loaded up from the database. And so if you want to change that and have it be respected right away, you just change the values in the database. Which comes to my probably last point that I'll, I'll make about this, which is the, the settlement engine. Um, so the settlement engine talks directly to the database rather than talking through the, the plugin or something like that. Um, what this settlement engine does, so right now there's, this is a XRP on ledger settlement engine. And so if you send me a, a payment, which you, everyone who ran a node automatically sends an on ledger transfer to my node, it look, the settlement engine will look at where, who, which account did it get that from? And then update the balance in the database accordingly. Um, so it talks directly to the database, which means that you can very easily like just scale out, uh, have a ton of different connector nodes talking to the same database. And then the things like the balance changes will be propagated or routing updates will be propagated automatically to all of them. Um, this is the thing where the settlement engine is fairly tied to the store implementation because of things like where does it store the balances and you know, what's the key that it uses, that type of thing. Um, the other 
Potential downside with this, although I think, I think it's okay, is that these, the settlement engines would have to be written to talk to specific database implementations. That means there's more work to be done on like these, the database integration. Um, I think that's probably okay, because th there's not too many different databases you'd want to use, um, but maybe once I've done that, then I'll get really tired of it. And Yeah, so there's always some lift when you're trying to talk to different databases. So, yeah. Yeah, so my comment on a higher level uh, was, you know, for both designs that sort of use the, the database as the communication between the connect and the someone engine is, you know, oftentimes that's considered an anti-pattern to use the database as the communication um, for precisely this reason. It's very hard to standardize what that interface looks like. And mm -hmm. so you basically have this like huge interface surface um, and, and it doesn't enable it very easily to be standardized or um, reused. Yeah, it's a, it's a fair, fair point. So there's potentially some downside to having different components talking to the database because it's hard, hard to standardize that. One of the things that I was, was thinking about was that one of the reasons to separate the, the clearing components like the interledger connector bit and the settlement engine is based on like the, free, the number of packets each has to process. And so it's super important that the interledger packet processing is horizontally scalable because you can get hit by just a flood of packets. And one of the things is that the settlement engine may not be as performant. And one of the specific reasons that I ran into was I went down the road of trying to implement the settlement engine in Rust and immediately gave up because talking to blockchains is horrible and talking to them if there's no SDK in the language that you're using is like my worst nightmare. And so I was like, forget this, I'm just gonna use a JavaScript based settlement engine, which is not a problem if the settlement engine doesn't get messages from the outside. Um, because right now, all the settlement engine is doing is watching the XRP ledger in this case, um, processing incoming transactions, and then sending outgoing transactions. And there's no communication with the outside, and so it's, there's no chance that someone can DOS the settlement engine component, which is a really important consideration, is like, can your settlement engine be, be DOSed? Um, and then it, my idea was that if you're processing payment channel claims, you would have that, that little bit ideally in Rust so that you could have the part that's processing incoming messages sent from the outside, in this very high performance, scalable, scalable thing. Just as a clarification, like I wasn't arguing against separating those two components. I think that's a great design choice. It's just maybe we can come up with an HTTP API instead of uh, communicating through the database. Potentially, yeah. So yeah, potentially have one of them speak to the database, and then one of them have an HTTP API that be, they communicate. Right? Yeah, yeah. We could we could definitely chat about that. The, the advantage being that if we do that in Rafiki as well. Like, we could have the same settlement engine for both connectors. I'm, I'm down. <laughs> <laughs> um, when it comes to the services acting on accounts, uh, do different services have, like, um, a way of saying that, like, you have access control at that level? Do you have, like, a service is only able to access this part of the account, and this service is only able to do this thing with the account? Good question. Yeah, so the, is there access control for each of these services? Um, not exactly. I mean, all of these services are kind of run by the same entity, so they, they aren't, it's not like, well, I ha, to be honest, I haven't really thought about whether they would need different things. Um, because each of the services defines like the specific API that it, it wants, it actually only has access to the, those bits of, of data, but that's not really thought of from like a security standpoint, um, more just from you only have access to what you ask for. But a service can say, I also want access to this other, other trait as well. One more thing to mention with the talking to the database. The other thing that this does is there's a um, interledger API component of this that is the thing that implements all of these HTTP endpoints. Um, and so this is the thing, this also talks directly to the database. And so when you instantiate this, the API, you pass it a specific type of store. So this would be like the Redis store. Um, and then it makes these different API calls to the database. And so just like all of the other services, it defines specific things that it wants from the database, which in, in, in practice is much more there's a lot more to the API than a lot of these other things. But what again is nice about kind of assuming that you have this tight level of control over it 
is that you could add API endpoints for things like check the routes that I have or check the, the balances because you're assuming that the implementation of the store knows where all of that stuff is. If there's specific keys that, that that's stored under, you can have different store traits that are exposing the same information to different services in different ways. So like the routing table is exposed both to the router, which just looks at um, like this is the my current routing table, let me pass on packets. Um, it also exposes it with the ability to modify it to the connector to connector protocol service, uh, which can modify the an internal routing table. And it also exposes it to the API. So the API can both query it and update it. I think I'll, I'll sort of. Um, it, it would be good to, like, at some level, standardize that API as well, because what would be great is something like MoneyDB GUI could point it. Any connect implementation and those admin APIs are similar enough that like the, the GUI layer works more than that. Yeah, so uh, one of the things that David Fueling, who I think had, had to leave unfortunately, but he's been working on um, trying to put together like what would an HTTP API for an interledger node look like, and we've been having some, some back and forth on that. So the idea would be to have some kind of interface that a bunch of different implementations could, could all implement the same API to interact with it. And this is one of the things that I think would make the, our tools a lot easier to use. So in my, in my view, a big, a big challenge that we've had is that we, I think, did a good job of splitting out all the different components so that they are separate and that it makes it possible to, for them to be developed separately. But then from a developer experience point of view, if you come to the Interledger project, you're faced with, I think the Interledger.js org has 60 something, last I checked, repos. And so you're kind of like, where, like what, do I, what do I look at? Where do I go? And it's very, very unclear like, which of these components you should use. And so, I think it's useful now that a lot of the core protocols are more, more standardized um, to have kind of a little bit more bundled stuff. How much of your code base ended up being unsafe as compared to safe rust? How much of the code is unsafe versus safe rust? I didn't use the keyword unsafe a single time. <laughs> Which I'll just say, so, so for, for those who don't know rust well, um, the Rust key thing is this safety feature, but they allow you to turn off certain aspects if there are specific ways that the developer is saying, actually, I know better than the compiler in this way, and I want to do something in this way. In earlier versions of Rust, you basically had to turn it unsafe all the time because there was just a lot of stuff the compiler wouldn't let you do. They've fixed most of those issues, so I haven't found a single case where I needed it. There's a possibility that some of the libraries use it under the hood, but the assumption is that they use that responsibly, use unsafe responsibly. <laughs> Last question. That's a wrap. All right, thank you all for listening. Happy to chat about it more.